Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, your go-to source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We hope you tune in often for all things people management, organizational development and change, organizational leadership, and social impact related. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Sarah Olin about supporting women to stay in the workforce and the idea of trickle-down momonomics. Sarah Olin, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm super excited to have a nice conversation with you today. We're going to be exploring how we can better support women to stay in the workforce, generally speaking, but also uh, specifically and particularly when uh, taking maternity leave. And that so often disrupts women's careers and their progression into leadership roles and such. And so we're going to talk about your organization, LUMO, and what you do to help women stay in the workforce and this idea that you've coined as trickle-down momonomics and what that really means and how we can better be supportive um, as organizational leaders of women and as you know, uh, husbands and wives and partners, how we can support each other as we're trying to uh, give everyone an equal opportunity to take on leadership roles and progress in their careers. And as we get started, I wanted to share Sarah's bio with everybody. Sarah Olin is the founder and CEO of Luma, whose mission is to support expectant mothers through pregnancy, maternity leave, and their return to work. Professionally trained by world-renowned leaders like Dr. Brene Brown and Mark Hunter, Sarah has over 10,000 hours of coaching and facilitation experience, is credentialed by the International Coaching Federation and certified by Accomplishment Coaching. Sarah's professional competence and dedication to her craft has opened doors for her to coach women leaders at the United Nations, Verizon, the National Basketball Association, Google, Duke Energy, Calvin Klein, Bloomberg, and to participate as a key speaker at Amazon's first ever International Working Moms Day. Regardless of the stage or space, Sarah pours love and humor into her work, helping women be happy and fully expressed as well as living their lives of purpose. Thank you so much for joining me. Anything else you would like to share with listeners by way of your background or personal context before we dive on in? You know, it's funny, even though I work with so many women, I I also work with men and find a lot of men. I've worked with a lot of professional athletes and um, (laughs) head coaches for um, various sports organizations. So it's it's funny that uh, someone who has declared herself uh, a leader for mothers and women also, we attract who we attract. That's, That's just how it is. Yeah, interesting. And yeah, it is interesting to, to look at your client list and uh, some of the organizations you work with. And uh, the, the, the point is, we, we need this work in uh, every sort of organization across the workforce. And it, it really is a huge gap. Uh, when we talk about pay inequities, when we talk about uh, gender disparities in leadership and all of those sorts of things, really what's at the crux of a lot of that, there's a lot of reasons for it, I suppose, but what's at the crux uh, of it for a lot of people is what happens when people go on leave, Um, paid leave oftentimes, uh, you know, everyone would say, yeah, maternity leave, paternity leave, this is important, go be with your your children, take time for your family. And while we say those things, it, it does actually uh, take a toll on people's ability to progress in an organization, to to move up in their career, to take on leadership opportunities. And those are all unfortunate outcomes that may not be the intent of anybody, but it certainly is kind of, it, it's the way the system is built. And, and we disadvantage uh, those who take uh, maternity and paternity leave. So maybe we can start with you um, dissecting that for us a little bit. Pe- pull that apart and help us understand 
uh, what the issues are there, and then we can start to get uh, more into to what we can actually do to support women to stay in the workforce. Yeah, so there's there's a few different things, John, in that. One is that there's a gap in management and leadership around how to support people who are going out on leave. So um, I have a colleague that calls it the manager lottery, right? If you win <laughs> as a woman and a mother, woo! And if you don't, you are, you're left in the dark, right? So you've got all these fears, you have all these unknowns, right? And if you don't have a strong manager or leader to say, hey, I've got you ba your back, let's navigate this together. You know, here's, because lots of companies offer things, but people don't understand them. They, no one takes the time to really say it's X, Y, and Z. This is how you access this program. This is how you win. And Lumo was created to actually give women the tools to succeed. It's, there's so much lip service, like you can have it all, you can do everything, but we're not actually given what we need to have that experience. And for many years, I ran a program in my own private coaching practice that was a 10 month long coaching program. And it took women from, hey, I'm pregnant to I'm back at the office and ready to go less mom guilt, less shame, less disappointment, feeling emotionally, psychologically supported, all the things. So before, during, and after mat leave. And what I've done with my team is create this 10 month coaching experience and turn it into an online program to support mothers in the workplace. Because it's a leadership conversation. It's a personal development conversation. And so often women are left to navigate it by themselves, right? They're, even when we were um, in early stages of the program and beta testing, there were two really high level women in real estate development and they were both pregnant and afraid to share. So because they were concerned that their male colleagues would, you know, win these deals because, you know, and so they're trying not to show that they're pregnant, you know, until the last minute. So it's just, we think we've come so far and in certain ways we have, but the numbers don't lie, right? 43% of women off ramp at some point in their career because of family needs, 43%, that is extraordinary. Yeah, it, and it's really disheartening. I, we have made progress and more organizations have more established, well-defined maternity and increasingly paternity leave policies and different uh, programs to support their people. All of that's wonderful. Uh, it, the needle has moved there uh, quite a bit. The problem is, to your point, that most employees don't actually know <laughs> what's really available. They don't really understand how to utilize it. And even if and when they do, so let's say the company is progressive enough to have some of these policies in place, these programs in place, they're really good at communicating it and helping people know how to utilize it. The reality is in most organizations, people are then still either implicit, you know, sometimes explicitly, but certainly implicitly discouraged from utilizing those programs and they you just look around and you're like okay well i saw you know i know this this is an option for me but i just saw susan you know last year who took um, maternity leave and i saw what happened you know when she tried to come back and i don't want that to happen to me and so some of it's just the observation that i i look around and i see what's happening to other people some of it is you know the the things that are said uh, even casually uh, and those implicit things that are just kind of baked into the culture of the company that discourage people from taking advantage of the programs. And that is a very real problem that we still have a long, long way to go to, to address. Otherwise, it doesn't matter how many wonderful programs we have. It doesn't matter how many great policies we have. If we don't see it as a real safe option for us, then then you have these behaviors like hiding that you're even pregnant at all <laughs> or feeling like you literally can only you know take a few days off and then you're back in the office um and those sorts of things and that's 
again, a problem for individuals, for their families, and for the organizations. True. And, you know, we're dealing with the most extraordinary workforce right now, multi-generational, uh, and our millennial employees are not willing to tolerate the things that my generation, <laughs> Gen X, was willing to tolerate, the workaholism, the inhumane hours. They are just, there are no, and I talk to DEI professionals, HR, prof every day. This is, these are the conversations that I'm in and they are, it is abysmal and they are suffering because there's always attrition, right? That's a normal, piece, but they cannot attract new talent because there's many, many reasons um, for the labor shortage, but we're certainly seeing it with women and millennials for sure. Yeah. And, and you're absolutely right. Uh, women tend to disproportionately take on the home tasks, child care, care elder care, all these sorts of things. Um, now, that's not a, a sweeping statement that that's the case for every family, every home, but right. on average, it, it's, on clear average. That's from, right. it's clear from the data that that's the case, right? And so, and we know that, for example, the pandemic disproportionately hit women hard uh, in terms of leaving the workforce uh, because children are at home doing school. And, and the, so a mom uh, was more likely to uh, to stay home with the kids and, and leave work than say a partner. And those types of situations, it is what it is. Like that's the reality that we're dealing with. And so, so then part, part of all of this conversation is everything that has been happening over the past 18, 19 plus months around virtual work, hybrid work, flexible work schedules. Uh, what, what kinds of accommodations do we put in place for our people uh, so that they can continue to contribute uh, and take care of family needs. And, and your point about this generational divide, this generational shift uh, is, is really, really important because you're right. The younger generations, they're simply voting with their feet and they're not putting up with it. They're not putting up with bad bosses. They're not putting up with inequitable organizations and systems. Uh, they have options. They know they have options, and they're going to exercise their right to choose very, be very selective about where they want to go uh, in in terms of their employment. And in many cases, they, they simply don't even want to work for an organization. They go the gig route, and they they uh, are part of the contingent workforce. While that's wonderful, you, you know, empowering for for young people to to take ownership over their careers that way. Uh, and more and more organizations are learning how to leverage um, the gig economy and, and contract and contingent workers. The, the fact still remains that for those who want a more traditional uh, career, a more traditional work life kind of experience uh, that there's within a corporate setting, that they're still having to struggle with that. And, and if the pandemic has shown us anything, it's, I think it's shown us it's really shown a light on the inequalities and inequities um, throughout our economy, throughout the labor economy. And it really has pushed us to challenge this notion that we need people there eight to five in the office or pu putting right. in these super long hours. Uh, like why can't we allow, uh, say a mother who's juggling childcare and career, uh, a more flexible schedule? Uh, certain right. job, certain jobs, I get it. Like you need to be there, but um, so many of the types of jobs that we're talking about, there, there literally is no reason uh, yeah. for uh, for us to put on those sorts of constraints um, to whether we're talking about men, women, whatever. Uh, there's no reason to not be more flexible. I'm excited to announce the publication of my new book from HCI Press, Bluer Than Indigo Leadership, The Journey of Becoming a Truly Remarkable Leader. Early in my adult life, I learned about an Asian proverb that translates as bluer than indigo. If you think about the color indigo, it is a brilliant, deep, and vibrant blue. What some would call the bluest of blues. To have something that is bluer than indigo is rare and truly remarkable. Contrary to popular myth, there is no one-size-fits-all or cookie-cutter approach 
to effective leadership. There's no silver bullet, no secret sauce, no go-to model that will solve all of our problems. The truth is great leaders have all had their unique strengths and flaws and have all had to discover and then pave their own distinctive path in their life's journey to fulfill their leadership potential. Bluer Than Indigo Leadership will help you discover your own path and explore those ordinary everyday actions that will help you respond to an uncertain future and produce extraordinary results for individuals, teams, and organizations. You know, Brene Brown talks about um, one of these undercover shame-based behaviors um, being nostalgia. And I think of it, you know, she talks about it as the good old days, but I think about it through the lens of attachment to how it used to be. And, you know, the old guard and the old ways of doing business, right? Like, if I don't see you, you're not working, that sort of like very old way of thinking. And I think the pandemic proved that it's absolutely false. You know, I have a lot of clients in big law and in big banking and in big law, they were afraid, you know, it's all going to fall apart. They made more money than ever. Same with the banks. So it only grew their business right now. There are other industries that have certainly really suffered, but I know um, for certain there's some big, big conversations happening right now in Charlotte around, you know, these big organizations saying you have to get back to the office and people saying, no, <laughs> we don't want to, we won't do it. So there's, there's a reckoning that's in process right now. And um, yeah, what are they calling it? The great resignation. Yeah, yeah. So it is, it's really tough for people. Yeah. And I have to admit, I, it kind of boggles my mind. I, I get the nostalgia. I get the more conservative notion um, of like, let's get back to work in the more traditional sense. I get those feelings. I get why people are espousing them. Yet we, we, we've proven over the last 18 plus months that it, it's certainly um, very possible for us to, to lean into a virtual or hybrid work environment and be very effective and successful. And in many cases, productivity shoots up, right? When we right. allow, when we allow for that. But John, what happens to these old school leaders if we say, you know, this new way works, right? The biggest fear in any organization and for any employer is the fear of irrelevance, right? So if that contributes to their, they're going to fight it to the, it's, it's all fear-based conversations. Um, so I have compassion for it and it doesn't change the fact that it absolutely needs to change in order for the world is changing every day. Their clients are changing that the work, you know, the way that people work is changing and either we adapt or suffer. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, something else I wanted to touch on, uh, and I know we've kind of already been, discussing this, but there's this idea of trickle-down momonomics um, that, that you like to discuss as a part of the, the LUMO um, organization and your work. Describe that a little bit for us, and then we can start to tie that back into what we've been discussing. Sure. So um, we assert that in motherhood is the only place where trickle-down economics actually works, because if mom is sourced, everyone around her does better. At mom is a generous giving being an entity. So when there's a lot going into mom at the top of the family, um, everyone wins. So this is our theory of trickle down momonomics. It works for employers to have their women and mothers well resourced. Um, it works in the family structure. Um, works in communities, it's fabulous. But oftentimes the gap is the trouble that they're working from a nearly dry well. So you get what you get. Yeah, so so how do we fill that well? How do we um, support and put resources towards um, working moms uh, so that they feel like they have what they need in order to be supportive of, you know, uh, in the ways that 
they're they're so wonderful at being supportive in. You know, I think it's so much simpler than people think it is. I think people get intimidated. It's going to be so much money. It's going to be, we can't do it. Then it's going to be crazy people in the streets and, you know, there'll be a revolution, you know, hunger games. No, I think it's very simple. We're, um, we're doing this program for a company in Seattle, uh, our parent caregiver support network. And you know, we present topics, we lead conversations, and these parents show up and get so much from hearing each other. It's about connection and community, but finding out what do people need. And usually it's love, support, reassurance. It's easy stuff, right? But we've got to be willing. We've got to trust our people. We have to invest in our people. And this is the thing that I think young companies, tech companies, really savvy startups. I've worked with so many startups because they know that their people are their most valuable resource. They're willing to put their money where their mouth is and not just say, we care about our people at the expense of our people, <laughs> right? Yeah. Where they're, right? So it's, you know, I talk to these young founders and they are putting their money where their mouth is. And that is so important. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm a big believer in the power of language and the power of narrative. And, and those things are important as a starting point. Uh, right. you, you do need to be able to, to say things that um, create an environment where people feel like they can start to move forward into those, the, those spaces. Um, so having a good narrative and having um, you know, being thoughtful about the language you use, that's very important. But ultimately, if it's not embedded and baked into the systems, the policies, practices, procedures of the organization, and ultimately the culture of the organization, then it's not actually going to mean much of anything uh, to the people in the organization. And so I can say all day long with the best of real intent in my heart that I want to be supportive and helpful and I want to give women equal opportunity and all those sorts of things. I can mean it from the deepest depths of my heart. But um, if I'm not actually, you know, putting it into practice, then it's not going to mean much of anything. It's not going to do anything or shift uh, the, the, the it, it's not going to move the needle in terms of these types of gaps that we've been talking about. Right. Something about the road to hell is laved with, paved with good intentions, something like that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So ultimately, we, we just need to be more thoughtful about uh, the processes within our organization, be more thoughtful about the tradition and the norms within our organization, challenge those things that need to be challenged. Just because we've always done it that way doesn't mean it's the way we need to continue to do it. Right. Um, and if ever there was a time to do that, it's, it's kind of this disruption that we've all felt over the past 18 plus months we definitely need to continue those conversations and not get lulled back into the sense of, okay, things are getting back to normal. Finally, things are getting back to normal and we don't have to like be um, rethinking things anymore. No, I think, I think this has shown us that we have to always be rethinking. <laughs> um, we always need to be rethinking. We always need to be willing to pivot and adapt. And ultimately, if we want to be supportive, we have to do more, you know, we have to walk the walk, not just talk the talk and put our money where our mouth is in terms of resources, in terms of energy and time and all of those sorts of things. Uh, and I love the idea of, of your theory of trickle down momonomics. Yeah, put put energy and resources and support into um, working mothers, help them to know that, that they're supported and that you're genuinely there for them. Uh, give them pathways, easy accessible pathways right. um, to take the needed leave and to re-enter the workforce without it disrupting um, their career, with, without disrupting the, the, uh, the leadership um, pipeline of the organization. There's no reason why that needs to happen. It's an no. artifact, it's an, it's an artifact of a, of, a, of a broken past uh, and we don't need to perpetuate it. True, and becoming a mother makes you infinitely more resourceful and just we say it's the next level of leadership motherhood yeah i love it well sarah it has been a real pleasure talking with you the time has flown by we're getting close to the end of our time but before we close today i wanted to give you a chance to share with listeners 
a little bit more about Lumo, how to get connected with you, find out more about what you and your team do, and then give us the final word on the topic for today. Yeah, so the best place to find us find us is lumoleadership.com. We're on we're on LinkedIn, we're on Facebook, we're on Instagram. Um, and we've got lots of amazing free resources for mom. We have a killer newsletter. Um, there's a real opportunity um, for women to, to advocate for what they want and need and to make requests and to make demands. Um, and that was a lesson I learned really young in my career, actually at my first job, you never know unless you ask. So I always, I always ask because the worst thing that can happen is someone can say no. So ask for what you want and need. Yeah. Advocate for yourself, advocate for others around you. Uh, and the fact that you're speaking up about a need, chances are there are many other people that have the exact same thing, but don't feel safe uh, to speak up in the way that you're doing. So, so your, your willingness to speak up and be an advocate for yourself will uh, by extension be you're being an advocate for others around you and for for others like me uh, you know I'm a man I'm having I'm part of this conversation but clearly um, I need to, to help and assist and be an ally in breaking down the the unhealthy systems and to rebuilding more appropriate systems and structures to be supportive of women anyone listening um, this isn't just a women's issue this is a this is a us issue and we all need to be a part of the solution and we can do it. I truly believe that. Um, we just have to put time and energy into it, be thoughtful about it. And if we do, we can truly leverage and utilize all of the human capital that we have within our organization. That's going to certainly help the individuals, the individual team members to have more fulfilling uh, jobs and careers, but it's also going to help the organization uh, to to maximize the human capital potential of, of the organization and have stronger, more dynamic teams and to ultimately uh, be more creative and innovative and more competitive in a hyper competitive globalized marketplace. Ultimately, we can do it. It's in our best interest to do it. And it's in the human interest that we take care of our people. Uh, so mm -hmm. let's let's do it. Sarah, it has been a real pleasure. I encourage listeners to reach out, get connected, find out more about what you and your team can do for them. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. The alchemy of truly remarkable leadership, ordinary everyday actions that produce extraordinary results. Consider how the nature of work has shifted over the past 50 years. With increased globalization, rapid technological advancement, and the shift in economic composition, the average job of today looks very different than the average job of 50 years ago. What will the jobs and organizations of tomorrow look like? Moreover, what does this all mean for organizational leaders? What are the core competencies and capabilities of organizations and their leadership that are prepared for continued disruption and geopolitical and socioeconomic shifts? Regardless of what the future holds, increasingly, leaders need to be socially minded, data-driven, decisive, champions of talent, and disruptors of the traditional notions of leadership, teams, organizations, and work. The alchemy of truly remarkable leadership will help you to explore your own leadership competencies and capabilities and consider ways to apply and implement them into your workplace and personal life. Check out Human Capital Innovations magazine, Human Capital Leadership. Human Capital Leadership is a free interactive e-magazine with the mission to help individuals, leaders, and organizations find innovative approaches to maximize their human capital potential. We publish issues quarterly in August, November, February, and May. Take a look at the latest issue and let us know what you think. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week.